Welcome to episode number 23 of the First Responder Wellness Podcast, the show where we talk about wellness, mental health, leadership, and what it takes to have a wellness culture within your organization. My name is Conrad Weaver, and I hope you're doing well. I hope that you are doing the things that you promised yourself at the first of the year. I know sometimes life can get busy and that can be a challenge, so I want to encourage you to keep on improving yourself. You know, some first responders go their entire career and don't realize how the job is impacting them. That's what happened with Darren Purcell. About nine months into his retirement, after 35 years of being a firefighter and a paramedic, the trauma of the job finally caught up with him. But Darren got help. And he has turned his recovery into a personal mission to help as many first responders as he can. So in 2023, with the help of his church, he launched a first responder support group. In fact, he and his wife both help lead support groups at Saddleback Church in Southern California. Darren's wife, Jody, helps lead the first responder spouse support group. So stay tuned for this inspiring story. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. I know you're busy, and so I appreciate you taking time to listen to this one. I'm also grateful for everyone who's joining us on YouTube. Thanks for watching, and please be sure to subscribe no matter what channel you watch from or listen from. This really helps us get the word out to more people about the show. And if you could do me a favor, if you appreciate this program, please take a minute to rate and review the show. That would mean the world to me, and it would help us get the word out again. Thanks again for listening and watching. And now here's my conversation with Darren Purcell. Well, Darren, welcome to the First Responder Wellness Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So for the audience's sake, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, what, what are, Who are you and what do you do? Well, um, didn't think I'd be in this position that I am today in my retirement, but uh, I was a firefighter with Orange County Fire Authority for 35 years, fireman, medic, captain. Um, I did a lot of things with the department as far as training goes and uh, mentoring rookies, mentoring medic students, mentoring captains. I uh, was always at the busiest stations. Uh, my last station was one of the busiest, and people were wondering, why would you go to Station 75 on your last three years? And I just enjoyed all the excitement. I like going on fires, and um, I'm very hyper, so <laughs> I got to keep busy. <laughs> so for 35 yeah. years... I was going, 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 and then I retired uh, mm -hmm. five years ago now. Mm -hmm. And uh, during my work time, I never once thought about PTSD or anything, mm -hmm. what this stuff is. I, I heard about it. Um, sometimes I, I would see people that would say they have PTSD, and I really, I just blew them off. I didn't think uh, it was a real mm -hmm. thing. And it never yeah. affected me. My job never affected me. I loved every day that I worked. I saw some things that you're not supposed to see, apparently. And uh, about nine months into my retirement, um, I was at my in-laws. And out of the blue, it just hit me. And it was like a light switch in my life. And I went wow. completely um, numb, anxious, scared. Uh, it was just, uh, I, I couldn't believe it. What was going on here? So mm. for about three days, was there something, was there something that triggered that, that all of a sudden this came on? I was in, I was getting ready to go to bed at my in-laws. My wife came in and kind of opened the door when I was almost asleep. And I think mm. the fact that I was almost asleep and she kind of woke me up, mm. something just stirred. And mm. I, I never had a panic attack in my life. And all of a sudden I'm like mm. breathing really hard. All the things I used to watch on calls. And, uh, so about three days went by. I was trying to figure out what's going on. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. I couldn't do anything. I was like a like a zombie. And um, so I started asking. I started asking people. I started talking to everybody I knew. A lot of my mentors started calling around, and I wanted to get better. I didn't know what this was. Mm -hmm. So um, I saw some people. I got a hold of the department, and um, I actually called my doctor first. And they mm -hmm. told me, we'll see you in about a month and a half because it was oh, wow. near Christmas time. <laughs> so I'm like, I I can't wait a month and a half. I can't wait a day. Right. Yeah. So um, 
finally got into a therapist through the department. We have something called TCTI, which is the, the, the treatment, the counseling team international. Okay. And uh, with that phone number, I was able to get immediately into a therapist and started finding out through therapy and through talking to people and everybody. I was, it was a mystery for a good three weeks. And then it turns out it's something to do with working for 35 years, seeing what we see. For me, in my case, not sleeping for 35 years. Now my body's wondering, what are we doing with all this sleep? <laughs> why, are we, why are we sleeping for eight hours? It, it didn't know what to do, apparently. Mm. So um, I started realizing after talking to everybody, I've got a lot of friends that have problems, my neighbors. There's a lot of people that are suffering with this that I had no idea. Mm -hmm. It's a new whole new world mm -hmm. opened up to me. Wow. So um, it lasted about, I would say, six months or so. I had to find out what it was, start taking medicines, going to therapy, trying all these different things. And I'm learning about things on the Internet and uh, mm -hmm. talking to friends and finally started to conquer my fears which were before none. Yeah, now so I you jumped right in. As soon as you this thing hit you, you jumped right in to kind of figure out what was what was going on, right? I didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, when I don't like something, I'm going to figure out what it is. So I didn't mm. care about who knew or who I mm -hmm. talked to. And it was good. The more people I talked to, the more information I got, the quicker I was able to get you know, better. Mm -hmm. and so it wasn't something that I know a lot of people when they have these kind of experiences, even especially if they're working, still working, they're trying to, you know, okay, what can I do to maybe I should maybe start drinking a little more and to put themselves to sleep to not think about these things to try to work on it themselves, you know, trying to figure out, but keeping it on the down low. Right. But, but you were just the opposite. You were like, I need, I need to get help. And so I'm talking to everybody. Yeah. I, um, I don't know how anybody would do this by himself. I really mm -hmm. don't. I don't know how anybody would do this at work. Uh, yeah. I thank God that I wasn't working at the time because I, I couldn't have worked. I, I couldn't sure. even walk around the house properly. Hmm. My, Were you afraid of going outside? What was that? What were some of those symptoms like? It was complete fear of, for one, getting into my bed because mm -hmm. it happened in the bed, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, looking at my bed was a scary thing. Hmm. And I couldn't figure it out. Why is my bed scary? And mm -hmm. I surf. I couldn't go in the ocean. I scuba mm -hmm. dive. Couldn't even think about that. I was getting ready to go to Rome on a trip that I had arranged with another couple. And I could not face the fact of getting on a plane. There, mm -hmm. There's no way. So that was in two weeks. So I had to call them and ask, tell them that I can't go to Rome. And they're like, why can't you go to Rome? And I had to explain to them, which was difficult. Sure. Um, so I missed the Rome trip. I missed funerals. And eventually, mm -hmm. when I started to get better, what I had to do was start conquering those fears by going to the beach and getting in the water slowly. Mm -hmm. And getting on a, my friend gave me a flight for one hour. So I was able to mm -hmm. fly for one hour. And mm -hmm. then that turned into two, which turned into now I'm okay. So I just basically yeah. had to go to all those fears, which I didn't have before, which were fake. Mm -hmm. They're just yeah. in your mind. Yeah. What were some of the other things that you did? You said you mentioned you went to therapy, you did some some medication. What was that combination that really was successful for you? For me, I believe the fact that it was a mystery to me. It's assumed that you work for 35 years. You didn't sleep for 35 years. You see the things you see for 35 years that aren't normal. And it really mm -hmm. came back to me when one, one of the therapists told me, so you think you're going to work for 35 years and go on 911 calls maybe eight, nine times a day. It's the worst case scenario of their life. And you're going to walk in there and deal with those incidents and just come out of there unscathed. And that kind of made sense. Mm -hmm. There's something in here that's not normal that we see on a daily basis. And mm -hmm. for some people, they're fine. They, they do the whole mm -hmm. career and they never have a problem with it. Um, then there's the lucky ones like me who uh, never thought they had a problem and it's in there somewhere. So I had to find out first 
what it is, what is this that's going on? And then two, how do I, how do I treat it? So therapy was talking about it, just getting it out, talking to others. And just the fact that you're talking to someone else who's been through the same thing, that really helps a lot because they understand because not too many people understand, which I didn't understand what this was. And then medicine is big. First responders do not like taking aspirin. We do not like taking anything. And that was the hardest thing for me was to take something that, what if I become an addict? You know, I don't, Mm. we all think medicines are bad because we see what it does. Because you've you've responded to those scenes, right? You've you've seen that. Yes. And it's somewhere in here. We don't like medicine. It's a a common thing. Uh, Mm. When I first get new people that I talk to, I'm not taking any medicine. So medicine's huge. When you're sick, you need medicine. One of my buddies told me, Darren, right now you're sick. You need to take this medicine. As soon as you get better, you start weaning off. If you're taking it then, we'll talk about it. And it made sense. Okay, I'm sick. I'll take the medicine when I'm not. Um, so medicine and therapy. And there's a thing called EMDR, mm-hmm. which um, for me, it didn't work. Because I don't have a certain incident that happened to me. It just was accumulation. Okay. Just accumulate. Yeah. There, there are guys that it's really good for. And uh, sure. it works well for them. It, it brings you back to the call and it kind of desensitizes it. And I tried that. That didn't work. But it was just a, I think for me personally, it was the fact that I didn't know what it was at first. And then I found out what it was. And then I found out how to deal with it. It just mm-hmm. took a while to go through all that. Mm -hmm. Do you think looking back at your career and knowing what you know now with how your body, your system responded, you know, after the career, do you think some of that activity, the busyness kind of kept those symptoms kind of at bay and that maybe they were there, but they didn't evidence themselves? hundred percent. When I went to work, my day was planned and it was busy. So I didn't have time to think about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, And on my days off, a lot of first responders were all the same, were wired the same, type A personalities. I knew what I was doing on my days off every single day. I had a plan. When you asked me, what are you doing Wednesday? (laughs) I knew what I was doing Wednesday. Um, Mm -hmm. I went for 35 years like that, like a robot. And I'm sure that had something to do with it when you finally slow down Nothing's going on. Your brain has time to relax. Mm -hmm. Then it goes, hey, wait a minute. We've got some issues to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I did have a couple things just before I retired. I had some heart palpitations one night on duty. And looking back, that's probably when it was starting to happen. I didn't think about Mm -hmm. it at the time, but now that I know what I know, that's Mm -hmm. probably was the start of it about four months before I retired. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. And so, so how long was that process to where you were, where you feel, you know, when you first had that incident and then you kind of got to a place where you were healthy once again, how long did that process take? What I tell people is right now I'd say I'm 95% cured 95% of the time (laughs) because there are times when it, it comes back, but Mm -hmm. now I know how to deal with it. Sure. You have the tools to do that, right? When I had it before, I didn't know what to do. So I would just panic. So um, it took about nine months for me, which apparently is quick. A lot of people suffer for years. Uh, One of the guys I talked to was doing NyQuil for 10 years just to get to sleep. Wow. Wow. So for me, nine months, it sounds like a Mm -hmm. long time, but apparently that's pretty quick Mm. because I hit it head on and talked to everybody I could as quick as I could. And Mm -hmm. that's what worked for me. Yeah. Now I know that uh, you're a person of faith, and we're going to get into the, the the work that you guys are doing uh, through through Saddleback Church. Do you think that had something to do with your recovery in this? That happened. Um, what 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 really happened was when I became sick, and during that nine months, I kept saying to myself, "I always tell people when they have a hurt to use it." But I never had anything like this to to share with people. I've never had a problem that I was able to help other people with. And once I went through this, I now I now get it. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of people out there that need this help. So 
I made a video for the department and told my story. Mm -hmm. And so now, unfortunately, every station has my poster <laughs> in it with, uh, if you need help for your head, call Darren. But um, <laughs> so people would start calling me, uh, guys that I knew for a long time, mm -hmm. and they'd ask how I was doing. What they're really asking for is, let me tell you how I'm doing. So I started getting a following of first responders from our department and other departments. People started calling me. And so I started getting this group. And then I, you know what, I need I need some more some more people. There's probably more people out there. And Saddleback Church is huge. So I, mm -hmm. I figured, well, maybe I can go to Saddleback Church and get some more people. Mm -hmm. So I went over there and started talking to some people. And I got a hold of a guy named Rex. And Rex told me, well, why don't you start a support group? Hmm. A what? <laughs> so I was like, uh, didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. um, that was probably uh, two years, two or three years after I got better. Mm -hmm. And then I heard about this movie, nine, PTSD 911. Mm -hmm. The timing was perfect. Um, you just happened to be out here in Orange County mm -hmm. looking for places to show your movie. I just happened to start starting a support group at Saddleback Church. I got a hold of you. We talked. Uh, we we set the timing of your movie to be my opening of the support group, mm -hmm. and uh, things have just taken off from there. Hmm. So, yeah, that event was was still our our record number of people in the room for a screening. So. Uh, uh, besides the, the the national premiere, but uh, I mean, you guys still have the have the biggest biggest crowd. So yeah. I know much to the chagrin of the folks up in Fresno because they were like trying to out outbid you guys. Little competition numbers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but yeah. So so what's happened since then with with your group? How does how has it developed? What do you guys do? What what's the results of of, of, of all that work? So um, once we started the group, I didn't know how to start it. So what I did was I called all the guys that I was already talking to and I asked them, does anybody want to be in a support group? We'll meet every two weeks, either online or in person at the church. And 95% of them said I'm in. So that was the start of my group was the people that I already had. And since then, it just randomly from the church website, from others talking about it, it's getting bigger and bigger. And it's it's hopefully going to get to a point where it needs to split in two. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing how effective it is for people that are suffering from this to just hear other stories, because a lot of people think they're alone. And that's the biggest thing with this is like, I don't want to tell anybody I'll keep this to myself. It's really hard to get a lot of people call me and say, I got a friend, but I can't get him to call you. It's it's really hard. So I keep pushing, keep pushing, and eventually they come around. But um, when they come to the first meeting and they see, I just tell them, just, just watch. And they, they can't wait to talk. Once they see the stories, everybody's similar, but everybody's different. Sure. We all we all face this differently, but it's we all have share the same things. We all I get that. I, I understand that. And that mm -hmm. seems to be a thing that they just can't wait to come back and and hear more stories and share their story. Mm -hmm. So when you come together and you share stories, do you then have resources that you can offer to the, these folks to, to kind of help them uh, on their journey to wellness? Yes, I do. Um, unfortunately, I'm kind of an expert now in, in this field. Mm -hmm. So over the, it's been about four years now, um, I've got all kinds of resources and all kinds of connections and all kinds of people. And then the other people in the group will share their information. So along with what I have and what all the rest of the group have, we have a lot of resources for people. And um, the biggest thing is, is, is that where, where do I go? Who do I talk to? What's going to work for me? Cause I'm different than that guy. Well, mm -hmm. you might be, but you got a lot of similarities. So, the resources just come. There's more and more each day because most of the departments now are starting to recognize what this is. Mm -hmm. When this first happened, to me, it was, it was all new. The departments were just starting to come to grips with this is a real thing. And they wouldn't even think about workman's comp for someone with a 
a head injury. Come on, mm -hmm. with a brain injury. So um, it's all new, but it's getting it's getting more recognized, and it's getting not to be such a such a bad thing in the world. People think mental health is oh my god, the guy's got a mental health issue. It's mm -hmm. starting to be recognized now as a real thing. Mm -hmm. What's the you know, you know, part of what we want to do with this podcast, with the film, is, is to kind of help break down that stigma of saying, hey, I, I have a problem. How has that been with the guys and gals that come to your group? How has that, how has that stigma been uh, squashed or broken down? Is, is there still a stigma in, that, in, in your community about this, around this subject? When you say squashed, yeah, it's not there yet. Uh, there's still a stigma. And I would say mainly it's with the individuals who have it. They still mm. feel like there's a stigma. Okay. I don't think there is, but mm. it's still something when you have this, you know, like you said, you're part of a community and that's what I am now. I'm in a community of fellow firefighters and first responders and police officers who have issues with what they see on a daily basis. And now you add to that what's going on with the police, not only um, do they have these things with PTSD, but they have their public that their perception. One of my guys right now can't even believe that he's a police officer in today's world, but they just they look at them completely different now. Mm -hmm. And that's one of his biggest issues is he goes to work and feels like he's, you know, being ridiculed all day by the public. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a, that's a difficulty for him. Sure. But sure. Is it squashed? No. Is it getting better? Definitely in the last five years, I've seen improvements. Uh, you see it in the media now. You see it in sports world. Sure. Um, it's, it's getting more recognized. And mm -hmm. it's, it's on the way, but it's got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So um, when you started working with, with Saddleback Church to get this together, do, do they provide some like spiritual reinforcement for this? Or is that something just that you guys just do it on your own and and – without input from them? How, how does that work? It's both. Uh, they understand first responders. We're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, like normally there's a bunch of support groups at Saddleback Church and they probably had their doors open. When they walk by mine, some of the words that come out of there, sometimes I have to shut the door. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, first responders, you know, we sometimes cuss. So yeah. um, <laughs> there's, there's classes you go through. You don't just set this up. You kind of got to know what you're doing. Sure. And spiritually, yes, um, it's not a hundred percent. Not everybody in my group is a Christian, but sure. Christianity is brought up. We pray mm -hmm. and uh, we talk about it a lot. And um, the guys that aren't, they're watching and they're um, they're not offended by, it, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And and so, uh, what's what's your how does this spread by but by word of mouth how, how do you promote the group uh, i know you mentioned something of being on the church website but probably not all first responders are going to go to the website and discover it but how does that how, how yeah. do you pass the word hey if you're looking for wellness resources for your public safety agency i want to invite you to consider the ptsd 911 documentary and educational toolkit this package comes with the full ptsd 911 film and the risk lock documentary produced by former Las Vegas police sergeant Jason Harney. In addition to both of these films, you'll get PDF downloads and resources from organizations like the ICISF, NAMI, the National FOP, and others. Plus, you'll get tons of additional video content not included in the PTSD 911 film. And this includes interviews, yoga exercises, and a lot more. You'll pay one price and have access to this content forever. So please visit ptsd911movie.com for more information. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. It's mainly word of mouth because all the, all the people that are in this, the word just gets out there. Mm -hmm. I've got a problem. I could call my peer support team at work. Um, I know this guy. I know this gal. Mm -hmm. Word of mouth seems to be the way that it's spread. My phone will just get a random phone call from someone I've never heard of. I got your number or your name from here or there. And there's no one place. It just comes from from everywhere. And it's it's kind of like a secret underground sometimes hmm. because nobody wants to talk about it. So they tell a friend and then he tells secretly, is it okay if I call you? You know, it's mm -hmm. 
they're surprised when I call them right back. They're kind of hoping I'll send them an email and maybe he'll respond in a couple of weeks. What they'll do is they'll send me an email or a text and I respond right away and they're kind of shocked. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to talk about it just yet, <laughs> but they're happy when I do. And we start talking and, and you can tell mm -hmm. this person needs some help now. And there's different mm -hmm. levels. I mean, there's, sure. I need it now. I need to go see the person right this second. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm pretty bad, but I'm okay. And then there's, I think I'm starting to feel a problem come up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I got to drop what I'm doing and just take off because mm -hmm. there's people, you know, ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any anecdotes, any stories of anyone, obviously without revealing who they are or their name of, of coming to your group and then finding help and getting to a healthier spot? Yeah, it seems to be like I mentioned a minute ago. Um, first, when they come, they're more listening. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're in a they're in a valley we call it. So when they're in that valley, they get more attention. Um, mm -hmm. There's a big group of people, but a lot of them have got out of that valley. Mm -hmm. So when they're in that valley, they get more one on one attention. They get more interaction with the group. People will be talking to them off the group. We meet every two weeks, but it, it's not like you have to only talk every two weeks. Right. So there's a lot of people still in the valley when they're with us, and then they're starting to come out of it. And then when they get out of it, they stay with the group because they want to help other people. Mm -hmm. um, so when they're in that valley, I talk to them a lot, and some of them actually they just can't take it. And I had, the problem is when someone's in a valley and I don't hear from them for two days, it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. So for two days, I'm not hearing from this person. When I was before, I started to get worried. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things that, that can happen is this one individual, you know, he's, he's suffering and talks to me, talks to me, talks to me. And then all of a sudden he's, he's not talking. Yeah. I start to think because, you know, there's some bad stories out there. Mm -hmm. So finally, six or seven days go by and he thought, well, sorry, I've been busy. I'm mm -hmm. like, that's... In, in this, I'm not going to say line of work, but in this thing that we're doing, we, we really can't wait that long. You know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. Yeah, so how important are those kind of personal connections and people reaching out and, and just, you know, touching the other person you know, virtually through the phone or through, you know, how important are those kind of connections? They're huge because sometimes there's a, there's a police officer, for example, and I can't, I can't answer his questions. The other police officer can Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a forestry firefighter who has problems with another forestry firefighter. They seem to have a better connection. Um, maybe one guy is suffering from anxiety where maybe another guy doesn't have anxiety. He's got depression or he's got something completely different. We all have, we all have something, but it's all different, but it's all the same. It's mm -hmm. kind of hard to explain. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like when yeah. they say you have anxiety, that means you have anxiety. That means you have depression. That means you have a problem. And that means you're not normal right now. That means you need to get help right now. So anxiety has a lot of different meanings. And so all these people that are on my group, some of them share a different bond than perhaps with me. So that's what's great. We have a text chain with phone numbers and we can just reach out to each other. Mm, that's awesome. Uh, so what's this mean for you personally, just to, to be a part of this, to be a part of facilitating this? How has that impacted you? Well, I say it a lot. Uh, when I retired, I didn't picture this part of my life. Um, when I was going through it, I vividly remember walking around just wondering to God, why, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> it was like, you know, the worst time of my life. It was the deepest pit I was in. And I, I just, why was the biggest question? Why, why, why? Now I know exactly why. Hmm. Uh, I had no clue what these people were suffering with. I wouldn't have been able to help them. You know, as a firefighter, you love helping people, but this is a different kind of help. And for me, when I get a phone call from someone new, it's the most exciting thing to know that I understand what they're going through and they can actually talk to me about it because before when I worked, I had no clue. I would have called him a big baby. Come on, man, suck it up. 
a lot of people over the years have told me me that <laughs> suck it up. Mm. Well, you, you can't just suck it up. It's mm-hmm. it's not that easy. I wish it was. This isn't something I I wished upon myself, but mm-hmm. now that I went through it, I'm thanking God that I went through it because it's one of the best things looking back that I went through now because I'm able to understand what it is someone's going through and how to help them. And they know I understand. Mm -hmm. You just, you can't explain to someone what this is exactly. It's a lot of, a lot of changing parts, a lot of moving things happening. And, uh, but once you go through it, you you get it. Mm -hmm. And and to me, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, so your group is just for me to kind of understand it better. Uh, your group is peer led, peer directed. There's no like a mental health professional who's comes in and leads the thing. It's you guys lead it, right? We have myself who leads it. And, um, I have special guests. You were on Mm -hmm. my, you were on my, uh, support group one night. Uh, I have different people that come and talk. We have subjects. Sometimes I'll show a subject about how to sleep better, Mm -hmm. uh, how to relax, something with the calm app, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I would say most of the time it's just a new guy's on, he needs to talk, and we give him the full floor. Mm -hmm. It lasts about an hour, hour and a half, depending on what's going on. But most of the time it's, it's fluid. Mm-hmm. It's based on what's going on that night and who's having issues that night. And there's no real structure to it as far as that, unless there's a, a guest speaker. I try to let him go first. Mm-hmm. So him or her go first so they can get that out. But um, it's very fluid and mm-hmm. I, I like it that way. Yeah. Awesome. So if someone is watching this or listening to this and they're like, hey, you know what? I think I need to do that. What what should be the steps that they, what, what should be some things they think about before they launch a group like this? If they want to join one, or they want to lead one. If, if if they want to lead one, perhaps in their city, wherever they're at. Yeah. Well, I would look up. Probably the first thing I do is go to Google, look up support groups, um, go to your local church. More than likely, they have a support group, and um, there's many ways to do it. But I recommend in your area, if you think you're not going to have enough people to join your group, that's not an issue. Um, there's many people on my street. They can probably use this that I don't even know yet. Hmm. They're everywhere and finding people for your group is not going to be a problem. And it wouldn't take long at all to, to join a support group and, and find how to do it. You need a computer, you need a microphone and you need people. Very simple. Mm-hmm. But what, what this isn't, isn't uh, uh, experts to diagnose their, their issues, right? No experts. If someone needs yeah. an expert, we'll direct them that way. Sure. Uh, go see your doctor for that medicine. I recommend sometimes that people take medicine. Um, and if if it's a specific medicine, I'll even mention the ones that work for me, but I'm not going to go give him a medicine. I'm going to sure. direct him to his doctor, direct him to a therapist. And with the, the big group that we have, there's not a lack of resources because everybody has different people. And Whatever works for them might not work for you, but we don't do anything professionally. No, mm-hmm. we just kind of wing it. Mm-hmm. How has the uh, support been? The response been from the church folks? They said they have been looking for a first responder group for a long time, and the fact that it played out the way it did was a God thing, mm-hmm. and that they're they're very happy because now they have what they've been looking for. They said for the last five years, they've been working on it. And I just happened to come knock on their door one day Hmm. out of the blue. And uh, it just was, it was a God thing. And then the fact that we got a hold of you and your movie, the timing, Mm -hmm. um, it was definitely meant to be. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a powerful night at a screening event uh, there at Saddleback. It was a really powerful event. And I really appreciate the, all the work you did to help make that happen. And of course, Rex and his team as well to, to kind, of, kind of support that. So I think I mentioned to you, um, I hadn't seen the movie. Mm-hmm. And I started promoting the movie. <laughs> and it, the word started getting out. And then I started thinking, I hope this movie's good. Because <laughs> I, I have some people coming now. Yeah. So, um, Thank God it's very good. 
and it was yeah. very powerful. And um, now you can actually watch it on different pro different pr formats, right? Yeah, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it, it okay. is out for the public on Amazon. We're going to also launch it on some other channels here soon in the next month or so. Uh, but it is available on Amazon. In fact, uh, today we're recording this on Thursday, January 4th. On Friday, January 5th, we're actually publicizing this publicly. Uh, tomorrow, uh, it's going out uh, across the world to announce this. So uh, when this podcast comes out, it'll have been out already. So uh, if you go to Amazon and just search PTSD 911, all one word, uh, you can find it and it's available for a small rental fee or download fee. Uh, people can access it there for individual use and for home use. Uh, and the film is available and we have sold it to more than 70 first responder agencies around the country. Uh, we've had all kinds of agencies from communications departments to police departments to uh, kind of Department of Justice, the, the, the DOJ of Wisconsin, DOJ of Ohio. They bought it for the whole state. Uh, so we had some organizations like that purchase the film and to use it. And, and it, and the cool thing is it's not only the film, it's, it's the, the film itself. And then it's all the peripherals that go with it. There's additional footage, there's additional interviews and some additional resources that are available for first responder agencies. If, if an agency purchases it, they get all that whole package. And so that's pretty cool. And I think, uh, I think, uh, Orange County, the fire department there has bought, has purchased the, uh, purchased yes. the film and toolkit. So, yes. uh, so they have it available for all their members as well. So let, as we wrap up here, let's talk a little bit about what you do today to kind of your, you know, you hear these stories, you, you get phone calls, your phone rings, your text goes off, you know, all times a day or night. What do you do to continue to maintain yourself and your, your mental health? When I first when this first happened to me, I started going to therapy. I started taking medicine. And she told me, you went from structure to not structure. And it's not good for a lot of people, just that fact. Um, I have I've found a lot of people that retire have issues just from retirement, let alone sure. the fire department side. So when she said structure, I thought, well, I better get something to do besides playing, which I do a lot. I surf and I scuba dive and I golf and basketball, all those things. There's more life than those. So I became a leader for a high school group of boys. Um, so that was the first thing I tried. I did that for about two or three years. I started noticing some of these boys have mental health issues as well. Hmm. So this whole thing turned into a working with this, these young men to the mental health side, to maybe there's more people started calling me for the fire department, police departments, and it, it just led me to this support group. Hmm. So um, I've tried a couple of times to get off a teeny little pill I take. I take a small little pill every day, and I think it's just that it's up here now. Um, the fact that I know it's there and I take it, it just makes me feel better. So I don't mind. People have heart attacks. They take heart medicine. You know, so I probably don't need this medicine, but I I, I just take it because it makes me feel normal. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I'm talking to people all day about this keeps me sane. Mm -hmm. I've learned how to deal with the different things that come up when they do. And just knowledge is power mm -hmm. and sharing is power. And God is power, of course. Mm -hmm. And the people that call me, sharing my story with them and them sharing the stories with us together, it just makes this thing all work. Um, you can't be alone. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest thing. Um, I've always got friends. My best friend would call me every day when I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. And one day he stopped calling. Why is, why is Mike not calling me anymore? That's when I knew I was better. Hmm. When he stopped calling me each day, I knew I was better. And I just continued to be better. And there are times it just comes back for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. But now I know what to do when it comes. Um, I don't want to talk about it because I, <laughs> I don't want to be there again ever again. Yeah. But you just deal with it mm -hmm. the way you deal with it. 
and it's it's part of life. And like I said before, 95% of the time, I'm good. Once in a while, I have some issues, but, you know, I learned how to deal with them and it's just, it's part of my life now. Mm-hmm. If you could go back 40 years and talk to your rookie self, what would you tell yourself? I wouldn't change a thing. Um, every day that I went to work, I loved it. I don't really think there's anything I could have done differently. I do know now that probably I would tell him to, the way we deal with those calls is we just joke about it with each other. Mm-hmm. Back when I started, there was there was nothing about first responder wellness. And I think now the new people coming on, if I was a new rookie now, which I know a lot of rookies that are starting, it's it's treated differently now. Sure. But as far as when I started and when I ended, there's really nothing I could have done differently. Um, I think people are just wired different. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, even though I thought I escaped it, it's in there. Mm-hmm. Um, the way it came out was unusual. Most people have a slow onset of these symptoms. Mine was like from this to that. Yeah. I, I don't understand that part of it. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't do anything different. I I had a problem because I would be in Hawaii sitting on the beach thinking about what's going on at work. Mm-hmm. That's not normal. <laughs> That's a good thing, though. I mean, you love your job that much that you're in Hawaii on vacation thinking about your job. So mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't change it. But I think luckily now for the new guys coming on, it's it's different and it's treated differently now. And they have a lot more resources. Mm-hmm. So for mm-hmm. me, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Mm-hmm. And it's a good thing that there's more resources and there's more, uh, hopefully a little less stigma, a little easier to say, hey, I think I need to see somebody. Uh, and, and I know we're not there yet. And for some places, it, we're pretty far from that. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of depends on where you are in the country and what town you're in and what the culture of that agency is. Because uh, it really, that's what it takes. It takes a, a cultural change and shift in how we think about these things and how we feel about them. In e- even in my small group in Orange County, the different agencies still handle it completely different. Hmm. Some are all over it. And some are still learning. And yeah. the ones that are learning, the, the guys have a lot harder problem getting the help mm-hmm. they need. Yeah. What's it's the, just, uh, in, in your group, what's the mixture of, uh, are the primary firefighters or are there also law enforcement involved with this? Yeah, it's it's probably 90% fire mm-hmm. and 10% police. And we give them a hard time about it. <laughs> we say, you can talk to Joe over there about it. You two can go in your little corner and talk your, your police stuff. We all joke about it. Yeah. It's Do you great. think it's it's more, it, it's harder for law enforcement to talk about these things than it is for fire? I don't know. I just know that because I'm a first responder, the majority of my people that I deal with are, first, are, are fire. Mm-hmm. Um, the police side of it probably have their own groups. And some of the guys that join me have just got a hold of me that way. Mm-hmm. But no, I think it's the same. They have different issues than we do, but it's, you know, it's all the same stuff. It's yeah. dealing with you, things that aren't normal. Yeah. Do you guys hold this? I know like in like AA, you know, they're really, I wouldn't say secretive, but they're, they're really careful about, you know, it's, you don't, you don't talk about what goes on. You don't share who's there, that kind of thing. You guys keep that confidential as well. It's totally confidential, but there are people that let me know individually. If you if you want to tell my story, you can say my name, whatever you want to do with it, because mm-hmm. I want other people to know it's me. Mm-hmm. Um, but the majority of us, we were in my group. It stays in our group, kind of like Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Well, congratulations on what you're doing, and I'm thankful that you, you got help. I'm thankful that you are... Uh, on a on a journey to wellness and uh, I pray that you continue to do that and uh, thanks for your friendship and your support for our film and for what we're doing and thanks for being on the program today thank you for having me Conrad and like I said the door is always open here if you're in town extra rooms ready for you all right I appreciate that and hey if you ever come to Emmitsburg you got a place to stay so yeah be careful what you say (laughs) i mean that with all my heart okay (laughs) we look we always look forward and enjoy hosting people here so uh and i'm just uh you know two blocks away from the odd house so uh 
that world famous pub on the corner in Emmitsburg for okay. most firefighters have heard about it. So, um, yep, I have to. <laughs> hey, thanks, Darren, for spending time with me today on the podcast. And thanks to all of you who have taken time to listen, to watch, and especially those of you who have left a review. I really appreciate it. And if you haven't, please do so. I want to be sure I'm bringing content to you that you want to hear and your reviews help. And I'm serious, if you're a first responder and you're ever coming to Emmitsburg, Maryland and need a place to stay, reach out and we'll be happy to help you if we're available. And please remember that you are not alone. If you need someone to talk to, you can always dial 988 for help. Be sure to tune in next week for another interview with an amazing first responder leader. Until then, be well, take care of yourself, and those around you and go out and do something great in the world.